Okay, uh, let me start with the apology. This is largely based on a talk I gave eight years ago for departmental grand rounds. I don't know, maybe Diane was there, but probably no one else. So, so I apologize to Diane. But I kind of augmented it, and what pushed me to give it is uh, this gentleman. This is Dr. Roger Grekin, my friend and mentor, who unfortunately died about 20 months ago. And it was one of the luckiest coincidences of my life when I arrived for my fellowship in Michigan in an arbor. I, I don't even remember how it happened. I think I was probably assigned or I came from abroad. I didn't know much about American medicine at all. And I was either assigned to Roger or I just uh, very quickly had to decide whom to work with. And Roger uh, was absolutely wonderful mentor, an outstanding clinician, a brilliant clinical investigator, but even more than anything else, a uh, wonderful human being with compassion, with uh, incredibly humanistic qualities. And, and I miss him a lot. So I dedicate this talk to, to his memory. So the title is from 16th century Rome, but as every American politician knows, uh, you cannot manage much in any talk without the Bible. So this is from the Bible, and uh, it's from the book of Leviticus, which is devoted to the description of sacrificial dissections from chapter 4. And this is in the original Hebrew, have, a, have a some feeling that there are some people here who have difficulties with Biblical Hebrew. So I'll give you an English translation, so, and it reads, and that's kind of a very li literary translation, and the two kidneys and the fat, and if you... If you insist very hardly, you could interpret the word herev in Hebrew as a secreting tissue. Uh, that, that, that is upon them, which is by the loins, and the lobe above the liver, which he shall take away by the kidneys. So, you know, if someone would like to make a story out of it, you could claim that that's a description of adrenal. For me, it's mostly, it's mostly an illustration of the fact that you can find anything you want in the Bible. If you, if you just look long enough. So, in our journey through the hundreds, last 400, 500 years, we'll meet a lot of prominent and wonderful people. And this is the first one of them. This is Bartolomeo Eustachius Sancto. Sancto Severinatus. He was one of the best known anatomists in the 16th century Rome. He was an interesting figure. He was very impatient and dissatisfied with the prevailing scientific dogma. He discovered and was impressed by the many inaccuracies of the anatomical descriptions by Galen, Da Vinci, and Vesalius. So Da Vinci and Vesalius were his contemporaries. And Galen was a Latin anatomist, which was still widely read in 16th century. So rejecting tech, he was bluntly outspoken in his criticism of the existing body of scientific fact. And so he speaks about the adrenals. I have judged it proper to write at this point concerning certain glands of the kidneys carelessly overlooked by other anatomists. I would have desired that this type of glands not have been overlooked by earlier anatomists as those who today pursue this art, and who have written quite long treatises on the parts of the human body, especially since they represent themselves as factual. So this didn't make him very popular in the scientific circles of Rome at this time. This is his, uh, what's called Opuscula Anatomica. This was published in 1563, and it contains his first four anatomical plates. These four plates are of the organs of the urinary tract, and they are remarkably vivid, maybe because it's the first use of copper plates for anatomical drawings. And this is plate number one. So I, I, when I look at it, I'm really amazed to think about it in 16th century without any ability to use microscope or enlarge anything. This is a very good description. 
you look at this, both adrenals, the most amazing for me is an accurate description of the venous drainage, which you can probably appreciate here, with the right adrenal vein draining directly into inferior vena cava and the left adrenal vein draining into left adrenal vein. So that's pretty remarkable when you think about that this was done in 16th century. And this is Eustachius' own description. The glands lie upon the kidneys, flattened and elongated as if they were little placenta. That's a pretty good description. As far as can be determined, prior to this description, the glenar glands have never been appreciated or sketched. He con continued a life of scientific inquiry using careful anatomical dissection and drawing. He died in 1610, largely unrecognized. Almost 200 years later, Pope Clement XI discovered a large collection of anatomical plates of Eustachius in the library of the Vatican City. He presented them to his physician, Lancisi, who republished them, and he named the autopharyngeal tube Eustachian tube. So most of you know the name Eustachius from the Eustachian tube. So 1563 is probably the most appropriate birthday date of adrenal gland. What happened later is a comedy of errors, uh, not surprising for 17th, 18th century. But in 1611, for instance, Caspar Bartolin endowed the adrenals with the well, important function of, quote, purifying or altering the black bile in some way to permit its passage through the kidney. So at this time, this was an old Greek theory of uh, mood and many functions in the body being affected by different kinds of bile, we still talk about melancholy, which comes from black bile. This comes from Greek for black bile. So, uh, the, so this black bile, according to Bartolin, was purified by the adrenals, which implies the adrenals are essential for the sense of well-being and optimism. That's not far from truth. But he invented, and there was absolutely no base for it, to allow the transportation of this purified black bile from the adrenal to the kidney. He suggested that there was a venous communication before the two, which is one of the earliest examples of well-known <coughs> scientific fact that if something doesn't fit your theory, then just invent a fact that will fit it properly. In 1629, Ryolan postulated, again based on theories, not on facts, that suprarenal glands, and he was the first one who used this term. So later on it was changed to adrenal, but for many years they were called suprarenal glands. Uh, so that they possessed a secretory duct and central cavity, which is obviously not true, but we have to wait about 100 years before this was uh, finally dismissed by another great man, Montesquieu. So I don't know how much you know about American constitution, the American legal system, but Montesquieu was one of the leading political philosophers of France in the 18th century. And why do I mention American constitution? Because his theories on separation of power between executive, legislative, and judiciary are basically the ones which lay at the base of American uh, constitutional system. So he was also at this time, you know, uh, in, there was still a possibility to be eloquent and to be knowledgeable about many different things in life, something we lost. But uh, he was also an anatomist and physiologist and was deeply interested in all these aspects of uh, uh, medical sciences. So in 1716, the Academy of Sciences at Bordeaux in France chose as a subject for a prize competition the function of the renal gland or atria biliary. So this goes back to this bile business. That they were still calling them atria biliary capsules or suprarenal glands. He was appointed a judge. And in his address before the Academy, he displayed a very comprehensive knowledge of the adrenal glands. And so he stated, to these glands there are no excretory ducts because there is no matter to separate liquids but only to subtilize them. In 1719, another brilliant anatomist, maybe the greatest of them all, Morgani, observed atrophic adrenals in two anencephalic fetuses. And according to him, this fact proves that there has to be a linkage between the brain and the suprarenal glands. Just think about it. 1719, 
And this power of conclusion, just based on the fact that he detected atrophic glands in an encephalic fetus, as he concluded that there has to be a linkage. It will take another 400 years before we'll discover ACTH. So he was also the first one who noticed that the kidney and the adrenal glands have common fascia. And he also was the first one to describe accessory adrenals in men in 1733. In 1805, Cuvier noted the gross distinction between the cortex and the medulla, but Huschke was actually the first one who coined this term. So 1805 is the time that this term adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla was first introduced. In 1831, an embryologist and anatomist, Arnold, was the first one to describe the embryology of the adrenal gland. He was also the first one to coin the terms zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis, and this is taken from his publication. This is a pretty good description of the adrenal capsule and the three layers of the adrenal cortex. So now we are coming maybe to the most fascinating figure of the story. So this is Sir Thomas Edison. In 1855, he published his monograph, Disease of the Suprarenal Capsules. He was born in Langbenton near Newcastle in 1795. He graduated, notice, age 20. At this time, you could graduate with medical degree at age 20 in Edinburgh. During his professional life, he saw the rise of morbid anatomy in England. I, I'm actually struggling how to describe what morbid anatomy really meant. Probably the best description would be to say was a science of finding correlations between clinical findings and pathological findings in autopsy. So uh, this was a systematic procedure actually introduced by Morgani to elucidating the relationship between patient symptoms in life and changes in organs after death. And this method of study was uh, very much pushed forward by Napoleon's physician. Unfortunately, you may know it, wars frequently lead to advances in medical sciences. So the Napoleon Wars, which engulfed Europe for 20 years or so, actually led to significant advances in many aspects of medical sciences. So he was particularly influenced by Corvisart, who worked about cardiac disease, and Lanek, who contributed uh, many papers on pulmonary and hepatic diseases. You may know the next name from discovery of the stethoscope. He's the one who discovered the stethoscope. I cannot, uh, cannot resist the temptation to tell you a story about Lanek, so which probably illustrates how much we lost the skills of uh, physical examination. So in addition to the fact that he discovered the stethoscope, he was also an excellent clinician in terms of physical examination. So he saw a patient with TB. And he, by percussion, he concluded that this patient will have two or three centimeter cavity in the left upper portion of, uh, in the left upper lobe of his lung. And the patient died, and there was an autopsy, and whoever did the autopsy went to Lanek and told him, no, we didn't find any cavity. He said, that's impossible. He went back to the autopsy room. They, they left a piece of lung in the body, and he found this piece of lung and this left upper lobe, and there was three centimeter cavity. <laughs> so this is just to illustrate what you can achieve by physical exam. And today, we just order CAT scans, MRIs, and so on. So he was particularly powerful influence on Edison, both through his anatomical studies of the lungs and, and this introduction of stethoscope. Throughout his life, Edison showed particular proclivity for dermatology. So his thesis in 1815 in Edinburgh was on syphilis and mercury, which was the only potential treatment, very toxic for syphilis at this time. And he also describes automata, what he called kiloid, which is probably localized scleroderma. In 1820, he entered Guise Hospital, which was one of the leading hospitals in London at this time as a resident. And then he turned his attention to chest diseases because of the next work, maybe, and a lot of work on correlation of all scultatory findings with uh, pathological findings in autopsy. His intense desire to reach diagnostic accuracy in life gave rise to several stories reflecting his obsession. One of his friends writes, 
He never reasoned from a half-discovered fact, but he would remain at the bedside with a dogged determination to track down the disease to its very source for a period which often worried his class and his attendant friends. So severely did he tax his mind with the minutest details bearing upon the exact exposition of the case that he has been known to startle the sister of the ward, the nurse, in the middle of the night by his presence. Such clinical studies, Edison followed up when opportunity arose by many hours in the autopsy room, elucidating the morbid anatomy. Uh, so great was his enthusiasm for this aspect of medicine, his interest in treatment was fairly minor, and you cannot blame him because there wasn't anything to offer in most cases, other than following the patients and then doing the autopsy. Between 1837 and 1847, he published five papers on the diagnosis of pulmonary diseases, all of them very important at this time for our understanding of pneumonia and pulmonary TB. But the, by the late 40s, he turned his attention to diseases of other organs, like fatty degeneration of the liver, hysteria, and the diseases of the suprarenal glands. In March of 1849, he delivered a paper before the South London Medical Society describing a remarkable form of anemia, which had for several years past been with me subject of earnest inquiry and deep interest. Finally, in 1855, he summarized these findings in this paper on the constitutional and local effects of disease of the suprarenal capsules. It is available in our library. Supposedly, they even have the original from 1855, but it's kept in the safe and I never succeeded in seeing it. But in 1976, the British publishing house reissued it. And this copy is available to anyone to see. I would encourage you to look at this. It's remarkable. Five years later, he died in London. In his preface, he states, there are certain, still certain organs of the body, the actual functions and influence of which have entirely eluded the researchers. Of these, not the least remarkable are the suprarenal capsules. And it is as a first and feeble step toward an inquiry into their functions, suggested by pathology, that I now put forth the following pages. What he reports is 11 cases, most of them with meticulous clinical and pathological description. He was also a medical illustrator. These pictures were drawn by him. I'll show, I'll show you some of them. There are 11 color plates. And this is the first patient that he described. And I'd like to report this case shortly in Edison's own words. James Wotton, age 31, admitted into Guise Hospital February 6, 1850, states that he was attacked with a cough three years since, which he was unable to get rid of by ordinary remedies. From this time, his skin, previously white, began to assume a darker hue, which has been gradually increasing. There follows the description of two hospitalizations in two different hospitals. He left the hospital in tolerable health, but subsequently lost flesh, became excessively weak, the color of his skin at the same time getting rapidly darker, and he applied for admission here, which was granted. Present appearances. The whole of the skin on the body is now of dark hue. The color of the skin does not at all resemble this produced by the absorption of nitrate of silver, but it has more the appearance of the pigment of the choroid of the eye. It seems to have affected some parts of the body more than others, the scrotum and pinnies being the darkest, the soles of the feet and pants of the hand being the lightest. Finally, the patient developed acute pulmonary infection and died. On autopsy, in addition to pneumonia and pericardiac infusion, what's described is the suprarenal capsules were diseased on both sides, the left about the size of hen egg with the head of the pancreas firmly tied down to it by adhesions. Both capsules were as hard as stones. It's tough to interpret what happened, maybe TB. In his discussion of the case, Edison notes, the slow and gradual inroads of the disease and the remarkable excess of pigment were sufficiently accounted for by the universality of the change that had taken place in the structure of both capsules. This patient, this is from autopsy, 26 years old, presented with back pain, right leg pain, subsequently developed nausea, vomiting, weakness, and lethargy, and died. On autopsy, psoas abscess, signs of lung TB, and this picture of TB involvement were found. So this is a very nice picture of causations, 
And you can see both adrenal glands affected by causation from TB. In this picture, you see a beautiful description of vitiligo. So obviously we have no way to prove it, but it's quite likely that this was an autoimmune case. You can actually figure out that from 11 cases, four had clear TB, which was not known at this time. You know, the name TB goes back to 1898. This was the German... Uh, physician Koch, who coined this name, they used to call it consumption in this time. But when you read the description of the autopsy with cavities in the lungs and so on, you can figure out that they had TB. Four were malignant tumors, two carcinoma of uterus, one carcinoma of stomach, one carcinoma of lung. Three cases, it's impossible to figure out what happened. And this case, for instance, with the vitiligo may easily be an autoimmune. Reviewing this case report, there's very little doubt that all the cases had Edison's disease. And let me complete this discussion of this maybe the most remarkable paper in medical history by quoting the final description of symptoms and signs by the great master Edison. Just the quality of the English language is amazing to me. The patient in most cases I have seen has been observed gradually to fall off in general health. He becomes languid and weak indisposed to either bodily or mental exertion, the appetite is impaired or entirely lost. The pulse small and feeble, excessively soft and compressible, the body waste. There is slight pain or uneasiness from time to time referred to the region of the stomach, and there is occasionally actual vomiting. It is no, by no means uncommon for the patient to manifest indications of disturbed cerebral circulation. We discover a most remarkable and so far as I know characteristic discoloration taking place in the skin, sufficiently marked indeed as generally to have attracted the attention of the patient himself or the patient's friends. It may be said to present a dingy or smoky appearance or various tints or shades of deep amber or chestnut brown. The body wastes, the pulse becomes smaller and weaker, and the patient gradually sinks and expires. I doubt very much that a more inspired description of Edison's disease can be composed today. What happened next uh, were numerous attempts to figure out what's happening, what are these adrenals important for. And the ones by radically brilliant Edouard Brown Secard, he was a very prominent French physiologist in the second part of the 19th century, can be cited as descriptive of difficulties inherent in experimental work of this time. So what we wanted to study is a simple question whether or not the adrenal glands were necessary for life. A large number of confusing experiments ensued. Bilateral adrenalectomy was performed in 44 rabbits, five dogs, two adult kids, nine guinea pigs, and two mice. Unilateral adrenalectomy is performed in eight, 16 rabbits, five guinea pigs, two cats, two adult dogs. Mean survival time was always longer. It was about 23 hours in those animals with unilateral adrenalectomy and only 10 hours after total adrenalectomy. Obviously, the curious thing is why the animals with unilateral adrenalectomy died. The answer is very simple. His surgical technique was awful. They were probably dying of uh, loss of blood and infection or whatever. However, two of Brown Secard's later dogs lived eight days after unilateral adrenalectomy, and he assured us that one earlier dog would probably have lived longer if he had not eaten poison by accident. <laughs> Interesting accident. So well, he predicted, based on these experiments, that adrenal integrity would be important and necessary for life, which is certainly correct, but it would be tough to reach this conclusion from this paper. He was also one of early promoters of, uh, I don't know if you were aware of who were the first one called endocrinologists. I always quoted similar to the aristocratic families in Australia who were proud of their connection to the criminals who were exiled to Australia by the British crown. We should be proud of our ancestors. So this is uh, the first endocrinologists were the quacks who were advocating different theories of injection of extracts of different glands, primarily testicles, <laughs> and always to males, obviously. And there is a subtext of sexual function beyond it, which was obviously not discussed in Victorian times. 
And Brown Sakharov was one of early promoters. He injected himself with testicular extract, and he claimed that he had a convincing proof that it works. What was the convincing proof? He measured the arc of his urine. And apparently the arc of the urine increased markedly after he injected himself with, with testicular. So this, this is a good experiment. And he could probably do it with standard deviation and so on and so on. So, <laughs> so these early endocrinologists obviously very quickly acquired a very bad reputation and people were calling them endocriminologists, or pro probably more appropriately endocriminalists, we would call them call them today, but these are the very forefathers of our specialty, and I think we should be very proud of them. <laughs> About 70 years later, two Argentinian researchers, Jose and Luis, and Jose got a Nobel Prize for a different work. There are only two Argentinian Nobel Prizes in medicine. Jose is one of them. From Buenos Aires, they, they actually proved what Brown Secac was trying to do that adrenals are essential for life, and it's adrenal cortex which is essential for life. It's the same technique as brown Secard. Unilateral adrenalectomy, bilateral adrenalectomy, but now the surgical technique is perfect, and the conclusions are in equivocal. So they say, double adrenalectomy is vital in most species, amongst them the dog. Removal of a chromophile tissue, it stands for medulla, is perfectly harmless. Extirpation of the interrenal body, that is the cortex, is followed by death. We may therefore conclude the cortex is indispensable to life. It maintains its vital functions without the cooperation of the medal. Now I'd like to mention a name that uh, this is a paper that they published, so the relative importance to life of cortex and medal of the adrenal gland. So now I want to talk about a Russian physician and researcher, Itzenko, that's rarely known in this country. Uh, in 1924, apparently without knowing anything about Cushing work, he published a short communication in the obscure journal, which is called in Russian, Yugovostochny Vyesnik Zdrava Hranenia, which stands for Southeastern Herald of Public Health. So he touched on the possible involvement of the hypothalamus in Cushing disease, and he thought that such involvement was important, and he alludes to it in the title, which in Russian is tumor hypothesis, polyglandular sympathocomplex, and sviazis abazrenium vaprosa o centralne innervaci vegetativne funkci. If you look at the English translation, you can figure out how confused he is, just looking at the title. Pituitary tumor with a multiglandular symptom complex and a review of the problem of the central innervation of the vegetative function. So what he writes, and I'm quoting here, he first describes the case, clear case of Cushing, this big pituitary tumor, probably secondary hypothyroidism, and he knows. It is impossible to understand the origin of our symptoms complex without the participation of the vegetative centers. The symptoms are easily understood if one assumes an affliction of the nervous system that is not grossly destructive, but more subtle in nature, where the processes of destruction go hand in hand with those of irritation and gender, engendering the processes of glandular hypofunction as well as com compensation. I cannot understand one word out of it. It's obviously <laughs> extremely confusing. This is a speculative paper. You cannot compare it to Cushing, and we'll talk about Cushing in a minute, but he still knew quite a bit about correlation between clinical symptoms and pathological abnormalities. Uh, you're probably aware of the fact that in Soviet Union everything was supposed to be discovered by Russian or Soviet physicians or scientists. So, so in the, I think in Russia up to this day, the, the syndrome is called itzenko cushing I don't know, but the rest of Eastern Europe probably not anymore. But uh, under Soviet Union, it's probably Itzenko Cushing. Maybe now it's more like Cushing Itzenko. <laughs> what happened later in the 1920s is that there was a considerable progress in the development of uh, reliable survival time assays of cortical activity. Using this assay, several groups soon claimed preparation of active cortical extract. But the, all these studies were superseded by Swingel and Feifner from Princeton, to whom the preparation of the first really potent cortical extract can be credited. 
They are material which is prepared, prepared by organic solvent extraction, supported at renalectomy as animals indefinitely, rather than merely postponing their death. And they show dramatic remissions with the extract in cases of Edison's disease between 1930 and 1937. And this was, they collaborated with two clinical groups, one in Mayo Clinic and one in John Hopkins. So there's an interesting question here. Why did, it, why did it take? It's like 80 years from the time of Edison until anyone could really uh, find this extract. And uh, it's, the reasons are pretty clear. The other endocrine tissues, because thyroid, for instance, the effective uh, extracts of thyroid gland go back to 1880s, 1890s. So the other glands, particularly the thyroids, the extraction has been facilitated by such factors as water soluble nature of the products, relatively large quantities of hormones, certainly true for thyroid, stored within the tissue, and in several cases, identification of specific target tissues which serves as assay system. So none of these conditions could be fulfilled for adrenal cortex. So that's how why it takes why it took so long. And this is another hero of our story. This is Harvey Cushing. And it's a source of patriotic pride now because we are talking about America. Harvey Cushing was a descendant of aristocratic family from Massachusetts, but his, uh, uh, his career was almost entirely in John Hopkins. He was a great neurosurgeon. He did transphenoidal surgeries. And we don't realize it, but transphenoidal surgery is a very old technique. Goes back, it was first used in my ENT physician in Vienna around 1890. He later abandoned it, and no one actually did transphenoidal surgeries between 1920s and until 1960s or 70s. So I cannot review his biography. This would deserve a separate hour or two. He was also very proud of his English skills. When you read his paper, and again, I would encourage you, 1932, John Hopkins Bulletin. The title is pituitary basophilism. So it's written in Shakespearean language, more or less. He is the, I don't know, he's the last physician. He's the last physician I know that got Pulitzer Prize for biography of Sir William Osler, who was a Canadian, but his career was in the US, and he's still considered maybe the greatest internist ever alive. So what happened is that in 1912, he encountered a lady named Minnie G. I used to have a picture, but I lost it, and I cannot find it anymore. And he described this case as painful obesity, hypertrichosis, amenorrhea, and overdevelopment of secondary sexual characteristics. Finally, he published his summary of all the cases he's seen in this John Hopkins Bulletin in 1932. So I'd like to review her case shortly. At the age of 23, she was admitted to John Hopkins Hospital on December 29, 1910. At this time, she reported being well until 16 years of age. Her menses started at age 14, were regular for two years, and then suddenly ceased. She began to grow stout, and in the two years prior to admission, her weight had increased from 112 to 137 pounds. She suffered greatly from headaches, nausea, and vomiting, sometimes accompanying the more severe attacks. She complained also of aching pains in the eyes, which later had become prominent, and there had been occasional periods of seeing double. Other noteworthy symptoms were insomnia, tinnitus, extreme dryness of the skin, frequent sore throat, shortness of breath, palpitation, purpling outbreaks, recurring nosebleeds, and marked constipation. A definite growth of hair had appeared on the face with thinning of hair on the skull. She had become increasingly round-shouldered. Muscular weakness had become extreme, and there were constant complaints of backache and epigastric pains. Physical examination showed a young woman of most extraordinary appearance. Her round face was dusky and cyanose, and there was an abnormal growth of hair, particularly noticeable on the sides of the forehead, upper lip, and chin. Her abdominal body had the appearance of full-time pregnancy. The breasts were hypertrophic and pendulous, and there were pads of fat over the supraclavicular and posterior cervical regions. The cyanotic appearance of the skin was particularly apparent over the body and lower extremities, which were spotted by subcutaneous ecchymosis. Numerous purple striae were present over the stretched skin of the lower abdomen, and also over shoulder, breast, and hips. 
Fine hirsute is what present over the back, hips, and around the umbilicus. The skin, which everywhere was rough and dry, showed considerable pigmentation, particularly around the eyelids, groins, pubes, and areola of the breast. The peculiar tense and painful adiposity affecting face, neck, and trunk was in marked contrast to her comparatively sparse extremities. From a neurological aspect, nothing was notable other than what was at the time were taken to be signs of intracranial pressure, namely headaches, slight exophthalmos, diplopia, puffiness of the eyelids, and congestion of the optic discs. Cella turcica was regarded as normal. That's just based on plain X-ray. Not only did the skin bruise easily, but spontaneous echemosis frequently appeared. She had 5 million erythrocytes, 12,000 leukocytes with 77% polymorphonucleus. Systemic blood pressure was considerably high, averaging 185. A year later, not Cushing, but someone else did subtemporal decompression in her case. I don't know if it helped anyone. But surprisingly, a year later, her menses, after complete cessation for 10 years, became irregularly re-established. She developed a few decalcification of the bones, but during the 1920s, her blood pressure gradually came down. And in 1932, Cushing reports that from correspondence, it may be gathered, that she is present in reasonably good health through some of the stigmata where marriage is still persists. We can only speculate. I suspect that maybe she necrotized her tumor in the pituitary and maybe it led to regression of the Cushing disease. In addition to Mini G, he describes 11 more patients, nine females, three males. The age, the age of onset was always relatively young, from 6 to 25. In three of them, a basophilic adenoma of the pituitary gland was described. So this led to his use of pituitary basophilism as the title of his paper. In three other cases, there was undifferentiated adenoma. In two cases, pituitary was reported as normal. And in one of them, surprisingly, the drillers were also normal. So he, in his paper, he describes the main features of pituitary basophilism. And when we read it today, it's, I think we would agree with all of this. Rapidly acquired painful adiposity confined to face neck and trunk, the extremities being spared, kyphosis with loss of height, lumbospinal pain, amenorrhea in females, impotence in males, hypertrichosis, he means here, so this, of face and trunk in the females in preadolescent males, pletoric skin with purplish linear trophies, hypertension, erythemia, extreme weakness, and then he quotes less consistent features, which poly including polyphagia, polyuria, and polydipsia, most likely due to diabetes. So all of these features are still something that we would include in any description of Cushing syndrome and Cushing disease. Polymorphonuclear leukocytosis as a result of demargination is also described. So it's an excellent description. Here's several pictures of patients. I, uh, yeah, I lost the picture of Mini G, but this is maybe one of the most striking of his pictures. This is the same man before and then the peak of the disease. This patient, the symptomatology was very severe osteoporosis and hyperpigmentation. In his final recommendations, he states, a disorder of somewhat similar aspect may occur in association with pineal, gonadal, or adrenal tumors. In fact, the peculiar polygranular syndrome may accompany basophil adenoma in the absence of any apparent alteration in the adrenal cortex other than a possible secondary Hyperplasia will give pathologists reason in the future more carefully to scrutinize pituitary for lesions of similar composition. So he clearly does not describe any adrenal cushing, but it seems like he had a premonition that something similar could happen as a result of other, not just pituitary tumor. And he seems to be less confused about this than many endocrinologists later on who were trying to develop some unifying theory that cushing has to be due to one. A common etiology. Another breakthrough came in 1934. So this is coming from Mayo Clinic. Kendall announced the preparation of crystalline cortical extract with a molecular weight of 350, empirical formula of CIFR 21 h 305 And in the next four years, Princeton Group and Tadeusz Reichstein in Basel in Switzerland characterized more than 20 compounds. 
including cortisone, cortisol, corticosterone, 11 deoxycortisol, and the study showed that they were all 21 carbon atoms. It was suspected from their structure that they may be synthesized from cholesterol, but the final proof for this came only in 1951. All this work required vast quantities of adrenal tissue, usually of bovine origin. Just imagine, batches of 3,000 pounds. That's what we are talking about. And they are frequently processing were not as common. They used new methods of solvent extraction, content current distribution, fractional crystallization. Reichstein, Hench, and Kendall were granted in 1950 well-deserved Nobel Prize for their achievements. So this is this paper about isolation in crystalline form of the Holman essential to life from the suprarenal cortex. And this is another achievement in 1940. Lee from Berkeley isolated ACTH. And also around the same time, the first pharmacological use of adrenal hormones uh, was described by Hange and Kendall. So this paper from 1943 described his method. It's again staggering. He had to use two kilograms of sheep pituitary. I don't know how many sheep you have to kill to get two kilograms of pituitary. I think it's, it's a, actually it's listed here, 5,000 sheep. <laughs> So he needed 5,000 sheep, and another 20 years were needed to establish the amino acid sequence of ACTH. So this only goes back to late 50s, early 60s. In 1944, this paper was published by Hench and Kendall. So it started from the observation that there were spontaneous remissions of rheumatoid arthritis in pregnant women and in jaundice. So this prompted them to use cortisone, which was the only commercially available steroid at the time, as well as ACTH, and these were their conclusions. Articular, muscular, and other symptoms were lessened notably, and sedimentation rate was reduced when either hormone was in play. When the use of them was discontinued, symptoms and signs usually but not always returned or increased promptly. This was the debut of the pharmacological of an indiscriminate use of steroids that we still see today. Obviously, there are many good reasons to give it. So in the last part of my talk, I'd like to talk about mineralocorticoids. So it's probably not surprising that the chemical recognition of both the adrenogenital syndrome and Cushing syndrome have preceded by the isolation of the relevant hormones by several years. This, was, this is not the case with hyperaldo, and it's not surprising because there are no striking features of this condition. So the only feature is hypertension, which clearly overlaps with so many other disease states. So the first clue here is the salt requirements of adrenalectorium as animals, and this was published in 1927 by Marin and Bauman. Again, this technique of adrenalectomy, so duration of life of the suprarenalectomy in cats, attempt to prolong it by injection of solutions containing sodium salts, glucose, and glycerol. So what they showed is basically that cats replaced with saline and other salt preparations survive two to three times longer than control animals. The real concept of mineralocorticoid uh, is a, as a separate class of steroid was introduced by Lab in his studies of electrolyte balance in Edison's disease. And finally, paper chromatography system of Bush and elegant mineralocorticoid bioassay enabled Sylvia Simpson and James Tide to isolate what they called electrocortin. It's a love story. They met in Oxford fell in love, got married, actually moved to Australia at some point. So they really discovered the aldosterone. And they named it electrocortin, but this didn't survive. A year later, Reichstein re renamed it aldosterone, and that's the name we're using up to this day. So now I want to play a piece of music. And I'd like you to identify what this is.
This one should be identified. Somebody is yeah, it sounds like the Michigan. It's 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 like it's like it's like yeah, this is <laughs> this is this is hail to the victors. That's the marching song of the University of Michigan. So the final part of my talk is devoted to this individual, Jerome Cohn. It's one of the greatest regrets, great regrets of my life that I didn't get to meet him when I arrived in Michigan. He was retired and living in Boca Raton, Florida. So he became the division head in Michigan in 1943. His entire career was in Michigan. He was actually a diabetologist for many years. But what happened during World War II, the, the Navy uh, was very interested in issues of acclimatization. The sailors which were shipped to South Pacific were functioning poorly because of hot and humid environment. And they asked Jerome Cohn to study it. And until I came to Michigan, I didn't know it, but U.S. military allowed for conscientious objection, even during World War II. But if you refuse to serve in the military, you have to serve in some other capacity, either as an armed corpsman or as a guinea pig. So that's what he did. He recruited 10 or 12 of these conscientious objectors. He built a special climate chamber in the University Hospital in Michigan exposed them to high humidity and high temperature. And he found very quickly that this leads to changes in their excretion of sodium and potassium. You know, they were losing potassium, they were retaining sodium to a significant degree. Aldosterone was not known at this point. Remember, aldosterone was only discovered about 10 years later. But he predicted that they were secreting some kind of hormone, and which is causing these changes, and they predicted that sooner or later he will discover a patient who will over-secrete this elusive substance, which didn't have a name yet. And he predicted that this patient will have high blood pressure because of retention of volume, will have hypokalemia, will have relative hypernatremia. And that's exactly what happened. In April 1954, Marjorie W., was admitted to University of Michigan Hospital. She was from Toledo, Ohio, which is about an hour from Ann Arbor. And I'll read to you, this is taken from his publication, which I have a copy if anyone is interested in another amazing piece of literature, medical literature. So what she had is, uh, she was 34 years old, intermittent spasm, weakness, and paralysis of muscles for seven years. In October 1947, she was paralyzed, quote-unquote, from hips down for two days. Several similar attacks since then, but less severe and shorter. Frequent attacks of great muscular weakness, other attacks of typical tetany involving upper and sometimes lower extremities. She was well between the attacks. Blood pressure, 180 to 190, systolic for four years. Trace of urinary albumin, repeatedly polyuria and nocturia for years. No vomiting, diarrhea, or drug. Physical examination, well-developed muscles, positive Schwosteg and Trussosa, and that's something we forget today, but if you have severe alkalosis, you can actually lower ionized calcium in hyperaldosterone, you can have positive Schwosteg and Trussosa. Blood pressure was 176 over 104, heart size normal, no edema, reflexes hyperactive. And he's quoting lab results here, the striking ones are potassium levels, which range from 1.6 to 2.5. Sodium of 146 to 151. Serum pH 7.62. So she was also severely alkalotic. She was admitted to metabolic unit, which was kind of a precursor of what we would call today clinical research unit. He kept there for about four months. And no one knew what, what he was looking for. And when you read this paper, it's amazing. All the manipulations of diet and things they did. There was no assay to measure aldosterone directly. There was only bioassay, some kind of bioassay that you could look at the effects of aldosterone. But at the end, he was able to prove that she had what we called, what we called as a new syndrome, hyperaldosterone. He reported it. It's a paper. It's from Journal of Clinical and Laboratory Medicine. 
which is an, uh, I think this society still exists. Michelle should know, Central Society for Clinical Research. It's a regional society for Midwest. He became the president of it in, uh, in January of 1955. And he used his presidential address to present this case. When you read the paper, he says that at this point, which was January, this was already like eight months after she was first admitted, that they reached the conclusion that she has this condition and they were considering sending her for bilateral adrenalectomy. There was no way to do any imaging. The only imaging at this time, I don't know anyone knows what was the imaging of adrenals at this point, was called presacral insufflation. What it means is that you put a needle into the abdomen and you inject air. So the idea was that this air would serve as a kind of a contrast, you know, that you could see adrenal. So obviously that's crazy. But uh, so what he did eventually, and this is not in the paper, but I know it from what happened later, he pretty much asked the surgeon to expose both adrenals. And they found four centimeter adrenal. I think on the left side, if I remember. They removed it and she was cured. And it wasn't a carcinoma. Usually with this degree of hypokalemia and paralysis, it was actually expect carcinoma because I actually know the physician. I think he's, unfortunately, he's deceased now, but it was also a hypertension researcher, Roberto Franco Sanz from Toledo, who was taking care of her many years later for diabetes. She yeah. was somewhat obese even in... Uh, in 1954, and she later on became diabetic. So this is the first case of hyperaldosteronism. And again, if anyone is interested, this paper I have here. So again, I didn't get to meet uh, Jerome Cohn, but I like to read to you. This is the beginning of his presidential address. You know, when you become a president of the society, you're supposed to give some philosophical discourse and kind of. I think it's very pertinent to us. I would wish that you would be able to talk to some other presidents about it. So at this time, in our annual meeting, your president, having been duly elected unanimously in accordance with prevailing democratic practices, is called upon to justify his presidential existence. It is my fondest hope that each and every one of you will someday be similarly elected by acclamation, or as all of for as all who have been in the spot before, before me will attest, it is a unique experience indeed. One important aspect of this job is that it affords an unfailing opportunity to catch up on past and current philosophy regarding clinical investigation, clinical investigation. Of this, as of this morning, I skipped in presidential addresses. In this field, I can quote the literature with uncanny accuracy and with a fine degree, very fine degree of discrimination. For anyone who may feel the need for consultation in this regard, my services will be available for a limited period of the time. <laughs> so this is probably some kind of a hint of the personality. Roger Gregg did meet uh, uh, Jerome Cohn, so I'm kind of twice removed from Jerome Cohn because of my association with Roger. Uh, so I decided to finish this talk at this point. It's not like Adrena recently ended. Obviously, it didn't. But things are changing. You know, the heroic era is over. Maybe the main factor behind it is that Bergson and DLO are already working on the radioimmunoassay. Pretty soon they will develop the first radioimmunoassay for insulin. And this changed a lot. You know, this heroic era when you really had to struggle how to prove anything because nothing could be measured easily. And you had to rely on your superb skills of clinical examination and then correlations with pathology, this era is over and the new era is starting and this still continues. So I hope you at least partially enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed to putting it together. And thank you. It's not exactly a talk for questions, but if you have any questions or comments, please, please feel free. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.